start the um, start the recording, and I'll get started right now. All right, so welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. I'm going to run through these slides real quick here. Um, we are very glad that you are joining us. I'd like to frame the lab. This is not, if you've never been to a, one of these before, um, this is not a standard lab. I'm sorry, a standard professional development training session. We do not have a uh, set curriculum that we're going to drag you through step by step and have you um, do things that may or may not apply to what you want to do. Instead, what we want to do is we want to respond to your needs, um, have you share things that you need solving, problems that you need solving around the theme of healthy teaching and learning, and also share the strategies and ideas that you have about healthy teaching and learning. Um, again, if you've not been part of Blackboard Collaborate already, you can see that the I'm sharing um, some different tools, tips that you have on screen. So if you want to turn on your mic um, and say hi, that's great at the beginning of the session. Um, if you want to raise your hand, you can do that, and we'll give you the screen time and mic time, and you can ask your question or throw out your suggestions um, with a little bit more uh, verbal empathy or nonverbal empathy, uh, not empathy, what's the word I'm, emphasis. And you can use the nonverbals of the video camera and your voice rather than just in chat. You're also free to just use the chat if you'd like. Um, and if you click on that little purple bar, you can open that up and you'll see that there's a chat bubble. Um, you can click on the participant list to see who's there. Um, if you are a presenter or a moderator, you've got that next button that lets you share your screen um, or some other things. Um, and then the gear icon lets you add your photo and check your microphone and, and do things like that. All right, I think that that's all that I've got. So my tip is this can feel kind of chaotic and it's partly because we're trying to hit do multiple things at the same time with multiple modalities. So we've got my video and a, a, a voice. Yeah, go ahead, JT. I was just going to say, when you get done, um, show the activity sheet to the new participants. To welcome to that as well. Yes. All right, exactly, right. Um, so the tip is to open up the, 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 the activity sheet in a second window if you have screen real estate. And that way, you can sort of choose do you want to watch my face and see what's happening in the chat? Do you want to jump into the activity sheet and scroll through on that on your own? And I'm going to share it right now here. And I click on share and Chrome tab, activity sheet, share. And now you should have an activity sheet. And I've, uh, as a tip, I've set the, the, and I'll show you this right now, the size of this instead of doing it at fit where it's harder for you to read, I just found out what size works best in the screen and I found out that it's 150%. So that gives you as the participant or viewer a, a larger type font to look at. And you can see that things are happening there. And I encourage you to use the, um, to get to this and go ahead and start adding some things on, onto the table here. Um, that you have questions about, and we will try our best to try to answer them. You can build off of something that's already there. You can um, look at the themes above and say, all right, here, here's a question that I have about, if you look down below or you scroll down below, you see we have some frequently asked questions here uh, that we've tried to find answers for. We've tried to anticipate what questions you might have and try to provide as many current understandings of answers with a huge disclaimer that this whole era changes from day to day and decisions get made and then, you know, some might be aspirational goals that are need to be refined uh, for more realistic practices. So here's what we have right now. Um, and one of the things about the lab today is that we have tried to make it both about physical safety, but we also recognize that people are feeling very unsafe. 
So there's a lot of stress there and a lot of emotional um, concerns. People are worried about their family. People are worried about their, their health. Um, so while we will try today to stay very positive um, and sort of upbeat about this very <laughs> difficult topic, um, recognize that it's more than just sort of a, a clean, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not just about physical health, it's about emotional health as well. Because if your students are feeling scared, that's going to affect how they participate in the class. All right. So, any questions from in, in chat or anybody have any initial questions to sort of start off? I don't see any other than the ones that are in um, that you're already wonderfully adding into the tips, questions, and suggestions. And I would also say that um, if you know any answers, add those answers or your thoughts on the right-hand side of that table, okay? JT, go ahead. It's sort of thinking about the, the amount of resources that are currently available and then some of the recent town halls that I've been participating in. Um, as a participant, I'm just sort of wondering, you know, with as many resources as are currently available, um, where is the best place to get started? Um, in terms of the most up-to-date resources that are available to campus instructors, graduate students, faculty, et cetera. All right, and I love that you you know the answer to that is the Instructional Continuity site, right? Instructionalcontinuity.wisc.edu. Somebody's going to add that to the chat, I imagine. A link to that, and it is diff. He 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 is a plant. You're absolutely right, <laughs> Angela. Um, that is our official answer, and we will point people to that. Now, speaking quite frankly, there's a lot of information on there, and it's not the easiest to find and to sort through. But that's the current best information that we have um, in sort of a general one-size-meets-all format. Today's lab is going to try to handle some of those questions that you might have specifically, and we will try to sort through the official information um, as well as unofficial suggestions and ideas that, um, with a caveat that that might change depending on the campus policies and such. All right, any other quick questions? All right, so let me let me just start off at the, the very top here and say, oh my gosh, if there were ever a time for us to be focused on the Wisconsin experience, and that is the idea of fostering in our students and, and in ourselves um, intellectual confidence, empathy and humility, relentless curiosity and purposeful action, this pandemic crisis is that time. Um, we know that we need to move forward, right? That's intellectual confidence. We know that we might not be confident in moving forward in remote teaching, but we're going to do it. We have to be, we have to have empathy and humility, recognizing that we don't know what is happening with our students, right? We have what's happening with our wire, wire, wireless setup and, you know, computer and such. And we have an idea of what should happen with the lab or with our, our courses, but our students are in different situations and we can't see them. We can't see the concern on their faces. So how can we be flexible um, to be able to do that? How can we be humble in a way that we're often not as instructors because we're supposed to be in charge, we're supposed to be the authority figure, we're, we're the ones in front of the classroom, right? We're in a new environment here, so we're going to be tripping, and we're going to be messing up all the time. And I don't mean tripping, psych, uh, psych uh, what's the word? We're not using drugs. But um, we're going to be tripping up and making mistakes. We have to be curious because we don't know what we're doing all the time here, right? We've got some insight. We need to know if what we're doing is useful for our students. We have to ask our students. And then it's purposeful action. This is especially important right now. The, the world is on fire, and we have we have to do our part to keep um, educating and providing citizens who are informed and attentive and involved in the running of the world. Otherwise, 
otherwise things happen. Okay, so fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and we don't have a lot of information. Um, things are going to change. This is not the forum to be complaining about why did they make that decision or why did they make this other decision. We do not have that kind of power to make the decision. So we can empathize and sympathize that there are a lot of decisions being made that are difficult. We need to acknowledge the elephant. This is different. We know that we need to be flexible. One way of being flexible is to componentize or make things into small chunks so that we can easily move them around as we need, as the situation changes. So whatever you can do before you start teaching, before you start making your, before you start implementing the ma grand master plan that is going to work beautifully is to recognize that it won't work beautifully, that things are gonna get all messed up. And so, Try to build in opportunities for you to be able to rearrange on the fly. This is improv, folks, a lot of it. You can have good training in it, but a lot of it's going to be, things are going to be thrown at you that you have to be able to figure out how to say, okay, what am I going to do with this? One way to do that, also improv, enlist the audience, enlist people, the participants. Say, hey, help me out with this. Students love helping the instructors oftentimes, right? Let me restate that in different terms. Students want to be co-creators of their course. They want to have some sense that this is their course, not this is your course and they're just taking it. So give them that opportunity. Some of them are so much better on Zoom, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, uh, Microsoft Teams, whatever it is that you're using, Canvas, than you are. Google Docs, Google Slides, they can solve problems for you. They can offer suggestions. They are also in a lot more classes than you are. So if something is working really well in some class that you don't know about, it's not useful to you. But if you ask your students, hey, what's working really well in other classes? Let's try to use it here as well. Oh my gosh, use that, use them. They're, they're smart people. Err on the side of safety, that's one of the big things about today's um, session or today's theme. We're going to try to be safe in class, in the classrooms. And then take care of yourself as well. This is the classic, um, put on your own ma oxygen mask before you put it on your child sitting next to you, right? So take care of yourself as well. All right, any thoughts, questions on that? Go ahead and raise your hand, turn on your microphone. I'm going to take a coffee break here real quick and give you some time. And if I could, I'd turn on some Muzak just to give you a chance. I miss Panera. We used to have iced coffee, and I've got iced coffee here. You can't hear it, but and bagels and cookies and it was so nice in the face the face days but times are changing let's answer some questions all right um let's start with jt's question in chat because that's right up on the top um hard of hearing students and using microphones what are some of the developments and testing that has already taken place in the activity sheet down below, that is one of the quests. Well, one of the questions is about microphones. Up, 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 up. I'll try to highlight it. And Jessica, I think you added this, right? So microphones. I have one screen, so I'm back and forth oh, quite a bit. All I'm right. trying to figure out where everybody's at. So I guess the question is, will I get a microphone? And my understanding is, and I think that you ordered this, but maybe Megan did this one, that microphones have been ordered and will be available for use in many classrooms. Um, I think it was Megan now that I'm thinking about it. Um, so instructors will get a headset, or that is the plan. At least it's been ordered. Now these are probably back ordered. I don't know. Right. But a microphone might be might be important. Having students yeah. stand up is is a good way to do that. Keep their mask on, right? 
Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, we definitely did order some um, different types of microphones. There are obviously different setups in different rooms. So some of the general assignment classrooms, uh, I think a lot of them have the same system. Uh, some of them have, if they have an existing system, they've ordered additional headsets. So uh, the goal would be that instructors would not have to share a headset. Um, but we did order some additional speaker boxes and um, kind of smaller personal amplification devices, just trying to get uh, you know, some of the things that are actually available out there right now. Of course, a lot of supply constraints. So um, they've placed orders. They're still trying to determine exactly what um, you know, will be received by the time school starts and um, prioritizing which, which classrooms um, that those will go into. Um, we're looking at, of course, the classes that have hard of hearing students uh, would be a, a first priority. Great. So that is a, a conscious look. You're looking into that specifically. That's great. Um, one other thing, pedagogically, um, as an instructor, consider alternate ways for students to participate. So we know that even in face-to-face -face sessions, um, in, in normal times, students, some students are really good at like, ooh, 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 I want to talk and I want to participate in class, right? And we love those students because they, they affirm that, that we're doing a good job, right? Um, but there are also people who need to think about things and giving them an opportunity to do this asynchronously through their keyboard is a much, well, it's a great option. So think about participation, class participation, both in the blended, you know, what's happening in Canvas or Piazza or whatever um, participation uh, discussion online forums you are offering, as well as what happens in the classroom. Recognize that it is it is difficult to talk through the face coverings, right? And things are muffled, and people might not be able to hear as well as normal. So, build you know be aware and um, build that awareness into your activities. Um, Angela, yes, it will make make it more difficult for nearby conversations to occur, and we have um, a link to. Um, Where did that link go? There it is. Number three, what will my classroom look like? You'll see that even in this diagram, the sample diagram here, there, there's space between people, right? So those lean in around the same table discussions where students are really active and engaged, you know, those are the ones that we love. That's going to be harder to do when people are 12, you know, six feet apart. Um, Lindy, go ahead. Yeah, so kind of on this same vein, I've been thinking about, you know, the, the section of the Wisconsin experience that I'm teaching is 15 students in a 98-person lecture hall in Granger. And so, okay. you know, you think that, okay, it's going to be, you know, think pair share is going to be quiet, but actually, if they're all, like, talking, I, I, I think there's an opportunity for them to talk to each other six feet apart, but then the whole level is going to get loud, and I don't know if um, I'm just I'm just thinking about ways to try it. And you know, again, I'm I'm willing to try it and say, hey, let's give this a shot, and see how it works. But um, I don't know if anybody has talked about think pair share in a large space classroom with a small number of students. Like if that's worth giving a shot. Yeah. Does anyone any of our participants have thoughts on that? Um, I do. Um, and that is. This is a, a, an opportunity to use technology in your classroom. So if you look at that diagram of the room with the, the very few chairs that are sort of all apart here, if everybody has a laptop and they're working together on a Google Doc, there's this kind of hybrid thing that can happen where it's it's a yes and, right? It's a yes, let's let's have a, a pair and share, and let's document it and make it a synchronous digital activity that can be um, kept uh, persistent afterwards. So it could be a way to use technology in the classroom that we haven't done before because we have to figure out a way to sort of minimize that six-foot gap. Right. So you think... Um... You, you think just starting with the tech, do you think, I, I guess what I'm asking is, is there is there any point at which trying to speak to each other just in the pair part of it 
is worthwhile and then the sharing would be the Google Doc or should we just start with the I try it. I mean I don't know what what classroom your classroom specifically will look like. Maybe you've lucked out and you've gotten one with great acoustics. You know that it'll that it'll work <laughs> beautifully in. Um, but maybe not. And you know be open let ask the students. Hey, yeah. what if we what if we um, used a Google Doc or or maybe you have maybe they have some other idea. Um, but that's a great way to sort of say, hey, student, I hear you. I am interested in what you have to say. I want I'm listening to you. This is your course. So I respect and value your ideas. And that that'll be a great for the Wisconsin experience course, because the students are going to be like, wow, this is great. I'm not yeah. just a number. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, I the the start of um, the start of semester survey that I usually send out, I'm going to send it out ahead of class, because usually I do that on the first day of class, introduce the survey, say, well, I want to do it. Now I think I'm going to do it ahead of time and then um, ask them, like, what their spring semester was like as they're, you know, wherever they were previously. Because uh, I think they're, we're going to have students coming in from so many different experiences. It'll be interesting to hear what they thought worked, what they thought didn't, if they had ideas. So I think it's kind of a cool opportunity to hear from them. Great. Any other ideas from folks? Okay, good. Well, let's go through the, the sheet then. Um, I th in some ways, we talked a little bit about the, um, well, the socially distanced room, or the we'll, we'll call it a physically distanced room, okay? Because hopefully we, we don't want that to be socially distanced necessarily, right? We want them to be socially connected, and but physically distanced. Um, but you bring up the question about active learning right now. And I see that somebody already put in the link to the remote instruction um, knowledge. And that's a, that is a recently um, updated source. So if you're used to things like parent share or oh, what are some of the other ones, JT, that are on that? I could open it up, I suppose. Um, like a minute paper, other forms of point, activities. Yeah. yeah. There's a bunch of them, and we have a link to that down. I'm sorry for scrolling quickly on the screen in front of you here. We have a bunch of those down farther on the this section called Active Learning in a Physically Distanced um, Classroom. So mid, minute paper, muddiest point, small group discussion, how to do that, uh, student-defined questions, think, pair, share, and others, fishbowl discussions. Um, we've started thinking about how to adapt these face-to-face -face things for a classroom where people are sitting farther apart? And how do we adapt it for the ones that where the people are teaching offline, or I'm sorry, online as well? So this idea of remote teaching um, where they're not, they're too far away to, to do these in traditional ways. All right, any other thoughts from folks on, on that question? Pardon me while I scroll back up. And Angela makes a really good point about social versus physical distancing. <sighs> I, does anyone, in, any participants have um, suggestions, things that have worked for them as far as making, feeling more connected even though you are physically distanced? Because it's a real thing. We're used to sort of operating more closely to each other um, in real life. I found, well, and I'm sure that you have all seen that we are now using a lot of synchronous video, right? And that can be very tiring. And even though, you know, when it's in, we're not tired, it's great because we get to see the expression of the face, we get to hear the voice. Um, but recognize that it's also very tiring. And, and if your students just came off of three Zoom classes or Blackboard Collaborate classes, and you're the fourth one, they're going to have you know that fatigue of looking at the screen at a sentence and focused and trying to look like they're engaged if they if you have their uh, computer on. That's a good question. All right. Face-to-face -face conversations can be delicate, especially those around identities and social justice. 
uh, up to the face field of the cloth along the bottom of my face so expressions can be fully visible to my students. All right, so that's that badger shield. Is that correct? Whoever at, at wrote that yeah, question? That's, yep. This is my question. Yeah, I'm thinking of the badger shield. All right, and if you're not familiar with the badger shield developed at UW Madison, it's a clear face shield, but it has a sort of I like I call it the blue beard shield because it has this um, it's sealed up on the bottom of the face shield with a filter, um, or like a mask, so you can still see what's happening with the face, but it's it's much more protective, um, and you don't have the 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 venting of of uh, particles outside of that. My understanding is that the UW has ordered some of those. Jessica, do you have thoughts? I feel we, like yeah. we have. We we have yes. Um, so the Badger Shield Plus actually has the oh, cloth. Oh, there we go. The shield is just the shield itself. Um, great. so you know, great option when the you need to see see the face. And I guess the point I was trying to make here is that fit. Tight fit is really what is going to, uh, and material is going to determine, you know, kind of how your um, face covering is working for you. And there's two things to consider. There's, are you controlling the source of your breathing? Uh, and then are you protecting yourself from breathing in outside things? So um, we know that if you're wearing a mask that fits you very well, that that is is providing both of those. It's um, kind of preventing you from breathing a lot on others and also filtering things as they uh, come in because there's if there's no gaps around the mask, then you get you know better filtration inward. Um, but you know the Badger Shield Plus does have a lot of gaps around the edges. Um, so while it's kind of capturing those very large particles that you're you know you're breathing out, um, for the smallest of particles, they're still going to find their way around the edges of the shield eventually. So I'm um, just, you know, want to keep that in mind that um, that is the consideration when you're choosing the Badger Shield Plus. All right, and um, I've just heard this week that definitely don't use the knit uh, neck gaiters because those somebody said they actually take large particles and they break them into smaller particles that are more transmissive. Well, that's um, interesting because I read that article, but we also had um, someone from a college of engineering who kind of, he made his own neck gaiter and I don't exactly know what the material was, but he did put a filter material kind of in a pouch in the gaiter. Uh, and we, we tested that with our respirator testing machine and he actually got um, the fit equivalent to an N95 respirator with his neck wow. gaiter that he made with a filter in it. He put like, I don't know if it was a vacuum bag or you know something like that inside of it. So I, I wouldn't discount all neck gaiters, but I think thank again, you. the material is going to matter and the fit. Yeah, thank you. And this is again, a thing that is ongoing. Um, you know, two weeks ago, I was all like, face shield, that's what I want to use. I want to use the face shield because that seems easiest, but it's changing now and the face shield is not a good thing. and. Um, okay. I think the problem with most skaters is that they're the one layer. So yeah. really to get better protection, you need multiple layers. So um, if you make your gator specifically to have multiple layers, I think you could get um, better results, but it just de depends on composition. Great. Lindy, does that, does that help? Yep, thank you, good. Yeah, it does. Um, I, I still also, I, the follow-up question in that was also about when we're having those conversations and students have half of their faces covered, you're basically just seeing eyes. Um, yeah. Are there any, I, I, don't, I don't know if there is anything to do, but if there, you know, if there is something, I don't know if like flashcards or something that students can convey you know something about their emotions. I don't. I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking about that. Oh my gosh! Emoticon flashcards. I think you could do it. People can hold up happy, hold up sad, hold up confused. Oh, well, that, that's a beautiful idea. Um, they would have to have their own. You couldn't supply them. Yeah. You know, back every week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think. Uh, I think we'd have to. You know, make that a, an at-home activity or something. Or can so could I provide, an a starter set of things like am I able to give them papers and then it becomes their own I believe the answer is um, 
if you need to, you okay. can. Yeah. Jessica, yes? I, I think so. Um, sorry, I forgot to turn my video on. Um, we just, you know, we don't want to prevent you from doing anything that you need to do to be, you know, a more effective instructor. Um, just kind of be aware of those kind of basic hygiene components. And if you're sharing things or passing things out, you know, hand hygiene and, you know, is still very important. So just kind of keep that in mind and, and remind students. Um, but I don't think we'd be preventing, um, you know, you from passing things out, especially with paper. I think that has been shown like paper and cardboard, you know, not to really be a great um, surface, you know, for the virus to to want to spend a lot of time, you know, it doesn't thrive as well on something like that. So, you know, just just be aware of the, the hygiene aspect. We did mention in our um, instructor document, you know, if you do have a lot of things you want to hand out, maybe do that before class, just so you're not walking among the right. students when they're there as well. But um, I wouldn't, you know, prohibit it. Just try to minimize it and then be conscious of the hygiene practices. Okay, so maybe if I were to to assemble like a, a starter pack for each of the students, they'd, it, it would be, you know, an envelope or something that would have these things, and then I would say, this is your thing to bring to class every week, and it's got your name tent that you need to to bring, and then that way we have the one point that I that that I've touched something that they're going to touch, and then after that it becomes theirs. Right, and time is our, you know, is our friend. So the longer that you, that if that sits, you know, a few days without you touching it, we wouldn't really have a reason to think there's any, anything of concern on the paper anymore. So, so if they assemble the bag three days ahead of time or five days ahead of time, okay, and then just dump them out on the table and let people pick them up. Okay, so don't procrastinate on this around. one. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. And that was number nine in the frequently asked questions there. Uh, the, the next question was uh, about um, safe breaks. And this is actually a, a really good one because a three-hour lab, we're used to saying, okay, let's take a break and, and everybody goes out, right? And they, they check their phone and they get a drink and they use the bathroom. But it's important to stagger them in face-to-face -face sessions here. Um, and I had not thought about this, but um, does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Ideas on how to do that? My thought is to just allow people to take breaks and say, if somebody's, you know, if there are more than one person out of them already, then please wait for them to come in. Because that way you wouldn't have multiple people like in the hallway together um, trying to come and go uh, come and to go through the same door at the same time, um, and that does bring us to a question about um, that that Lane is talking about in the in the chat um, of how do you dismiss them? We we do have a section on that where it's basically exactly what Lane was saying: consider dismissing by row, give people a little bit of extra time. Um, I believe that there will be markers in the hallways to remind students to not just sit around in the hallways. They are not going to be lounging places um, as they have been in for years, <laughs> forever, um, but to keep moving and stay right in the hallways and such. Right. And I, I would correct? just, yeah, everybody um, just kind of think about it's really, it's distance and time is is what we need to think about. So. The question I see in the chat about the bathroom. Um, you know, we don't spend a lot of time in the bathroom generally. Um, bathrooms actually do have direct exhaust to the outside, so right. there's no recirculation of air. Pretty good air movement in a bathroom. So, um, you know, you don't spend a lot of time in the bathroom. You're not trying to usually get really close to people in the bathroom. So, you know, I, I don't know that that is really a concern. Hallways, doorways, you know, we, we go to the grocery store, you know, you walk by people, kind of that brief encounter where you're passing someone isn't as concerning as, you know, sitting next, you know, right next to someone for a long period of time, 15, 20 minutes. So um, I would just kind of keep that whole time distance um, in mind. Very good. All right. Um, and we do talk about breakout sessions a little bit. Um, I, you know, another one of the things, uh, I guess just to go 
to, to reinforce, you know, with the idea of having a face shield and mask, having their faces covered, being socially distanced, um, Lindy's point about only being able to see their eyes, these are all things that are abnormal, right, in a classroom. And these are things that we have to try to conscientiously counter by doing things like saying, hey, students, I want you to create a biography page in Canvas. Everybody gets a page in Canvas. I want a picture of who you, you know of your face so that we can see who you are, so that we can learn a little bit about you because we're going to be robbed of some of your identity by you having a face shield on or mask on or being farther apart. It's, it's going to be a less intimate situation by design. So what are the ways that we can build those bridges and make people feel a little bit less, less isolated um, through digital means, through other sort of in-class icebreakers? We might have to have more conscientious social uh, uh, cohort building exercises, community building exercises than normal because a lot of that happens in the content in a normal situation and this is not, again, normal. Good, okay. Breakout set discussions and ensure uh, different people in class. Um, another way to do that is, I don't know. Again, I would look towards a lot of the work going into the blended space. Um, if they need to work on things together. Um, next week, Tuesday, we're having a, uh, an active teaching lab on how to teach labs and uh, clinical experiences. Uh, a lot of those courses where um, we typically work very close together. So we're gonna have more information on that next week, Tuesday, at next week, Tuesday's lab. All right, people, how do you know if a student is struggling? There is this, um, hey, I'm struggling. Here's my red cup, system right. There's a raise your hand if you're getting this, right? The, the sort of time, or you know, are you getting it, check. Um, there, what ways can you also, um, can you figure out ways, again, in sort of a remote environment in Canvas or Piazza first, or Google Forms, to have students check on, ch to check up on students and say, are you getting it? You can make it anonymous in a Google form. You can make it anonymous in Piazza. Not anonymous to you, though. Um, anonymous survey in Canvas quiz. Have them reflect on, are they getting it? Are they struggling or are they not struggling? If it's anonymous, they'll be more likely to say, hey, I don't get it, than, hey, my name is John Martin. I'm the dumb kid in your class, and I don't get it. Like, I don't want to say that to any instructor. But if I can that anonymously, I will because, oh my gosh, I need you to slow down because I'm just not getting it. Um, and that was if they're struggling, I guess if they're struggling or academically or socially or emotionally. So other ideas that people have? And Angela, I think that having students work independently this semester, that's valid because if you force them to work with a lab partner, I mean, if you can make, it's a much, it's much nicer to have that sort of connection. Can they work independently um, physically and then pair them up and have them, you know, digitally connect and say, I tried this, I tried this, and this happened or that happened. Um, yeah, I mean, the way I have it in my head is, because I have 36 students in a lab class and that's not, feasible in my lab space. So uh, they're going to be, they're all going to have a lab partner and actually like a little group of four. And so each week the group would kind of decide who's going in. So that way, when I put them into groups, if there are any students who have identified like that they don't want to come to campus or anything like that, the group can kind of send in someone each week. But then part of that follow-up would be by coming into lab and getting to do the lab activity, you would also sort of share your experiences with the rest of the team. Which I don't yeah. totally un have the format clarified yet, but I think it's sort of the best I can because I collaboration is such a huge part of the class. Um, and when yeah. when students work in a lab space, it, you know, it's little things like, oh, where did she say that is, or how do I do this? And it's things that I'm happy to be there for them to answer, but 
I think there's going to be a lot of they'd rather talk to their partner and ask those little questions um, yeah. than like ask the instructor. So we'll see how it goes. Um, and I, I want to point us down to the bottom, to sort of the lower part of, well, a couple of sections down in the activity sheet. Um, to the section on creating a culture of caring. And this is one of the things that you said, Angela, is, is um, made me think of this. Some of the students will feel safe coming. Some of them may not feel safe coming um, into campus. And I think that it's important that we respect that and that we recognize that just as we often as instructors, whether and we don't mean to, but the people who raise their hand and participate in class, the extroverts out there, we are like, wow, oh, they're getting it. This is great. They got it. Um, and they might not be getting it way better than somebody who's not participating extrovertically in class. Um, but because they're saying this, this is like, you know, it's a, it's a performative thing. We have to be careful that if people are staying at home, we do not penalize them for doing so or overly reward the people who have the luxury and affordances to be able to come into campus. Um, just as you know, we can't, when we're doing a remote instruction, say, oh, those of you who have enough high bandwidth to turn your camera on, you're getting better grades than those of you who are hiding you know, with your camera off. Um, we have to recognize that, that some people can turn on their camera. Some people, if they turn on their camera, their internet goes down because their younger brother and sister are using the camera for their K-12 um, schooling and their parents are working in, at home um, using their camera for something else. So it's going to be kind of a, a difficult situation. So this idea of creating a culture of caring is, is really important. Um, it's, again, practicing empathy and humility in the Wisconsin experience, right? What are the things that we can do to to do that. And we've got some suggestions here in red, um, more suggestions down in these uh, pedagogical practices here. A lot of it is um, being flexible. We've heard this before, empowering the students so that they can be co-creators and sharing the stories. Um, yeah, Claire, can you do you feel okay turning on your microphone and, and speaking speaking to some of this? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, there yes, we go. Can. Thank you. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so this is, is kind of my wheelhouse within University Health Services. I, I work to support healthy academic settings all the time and in particular now. Um, and so a lot of these trauma-informed principles are just good, good teaching practices anytime, yes. anywhere. It's not necessarily new. It's just extremely important now in the context of of what your students are likely dealing with and you yourselves um, are dealing with. And so um, I don't wanna repeat everything that you said, John. I think there's some great examples here. Uh, and this can look different in some of the different types of classes or lab sessions or- um, They absolutely will. And with different instructors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure, but I'm happy, I'm always happy to try and problem solve too. If folks have questions about how some of these principles or practices might apply to your particular class. Uh, we can walk through some more specific scenarios as well. Um, but to the point that I put in the chat, I think that idea that not, you know, the same exposure doesn't necessarily equal the same risk for our students is something to keep in mind, even if we think of our students in a particular class as, um, you know, a somewhat homogenous population, which isn't necessarily true, but we might think that that um, right now it's really important to keep in mind that um, that's probably not the case. And so if students aren't coming to class, like John was talking about, because they don't feel physically safe, or if students are engaging more or less in different ways, um, trying to connect with your students around what's going on outside of class will become, as, as John highlighted, the relationships piece will become even more important. Um, and, and the kind of dichotomy too, I'll just point out with trauma-informed practices, the need to provide that structure and rhythm while at the same time providing flexibility is sometimes a sticking point because it feels challenging to do both at once. 
yep. and they're both <laughs> equally important. So creating the opportunity for students to um, engage in a structured, predictable rhythm and routine in their learning um, and through the types of things that they're asked to do in their learning and when they can't do that, the flexibility to do things differently. Yep. Um, participants, any other ideas or thoughts on, on ways to sort of um, provide flexibility that you might not normally do in your, in your regular face-to-face co -face courses? Extended deadlines, yep. And one of the things that um, one of my accessibility and, and universal design for learning heroes, um, Morton Gernsbacher talks about is um, she doesn't necessarily extend deadlines, but she will take a very small amount off if you're you know, one day late and a very small amount off if you're two days late. So there's, there's some penalty but it's not like, oh, you've missed the deadline and you fail the class because, you know, your your parents died yesterday. And so, you know, it's like, please don't do that. Please do not create high stakes assessments and assignments that must be done synchronously in this one time. If you have a high stakes thing, make it a, a process that happens over a period of time. So if something happens to the student within that period of time, they still have time to do it. If, it, if they have to be 100% on at their best in one, you know, in a 90 minute exam, for example, a midterm exam, and something happens during that, it may have inadvertently ruined their campus college career. So it's hard enough to do that in a controlled traditional um, semester, but in this environment, it's really, it's really difficult to do that. So flexibility, offering um, lower stakes cumulative options rather than high stakes um, periodic assessments is, is, is another one. All right, back to the questions. All right, we did that one. So we are now on Blackboard Collaborate or Zoom while we're in class together. Should they wear earbuds? Yeah, if you've ever tried doing um, a video conferencing while um, in the same room with other people, it gets super chaotic and echoey and it just does not work. Um, I might suggest not having any sort of audio for that. Um, many students are very good at um, the, well, it's not even thumbing anymore, is it? Um, at the swipe texting back and forth. Um, I expect that we will see more laptops and tablets in the classroom than we have in previous years, and you might want to take advantage of that. Um, so you can turn on the video if you need to, um, but even a sort of a, a synchronous uh, text-based chat back and forth where they're working together on a Google document, they could use the Google chat feature on the Google document or in Canvas or whatever the problem that you're having the project that they're having them work on. Yeah, it's it, excellent point, Karen. It is painful to hear that microphone feedback and it just throws everybody off. All right, presentations in small labs. Um, yeah, the voice would be one part of it. Um, is it loud enough? Um, and if it's a shared microphone, you're going to have to use those wipes that we expect will be in all the classrooms um, and wipe it down as you pass it around. I This idea of having them record the video and do it asynchronously online is, I think, a great idea. And also, yeah, this is an excellent point about it. If the students are doing it in the safety of their own home, then they don't have to have the the mask and the, the face shield and the covering, their voice will be more clear and it will capture a lot more of those, um, the nonverbal elements that we will miss in our face-to-face -face masked or um, face covered um, presentation settings. Good. 
Attendance. So this is a really good question. Um, my understanding is that attendance is up to the instructor. I suspect that that is not true for some courses. Um, but I think that at the course level, the course design team, the instructors, if it's co-taught, the individual instructor can make the decision about, hey, if you do not feel like coming in today because, or any day, you do not have to try to figure out ways for them to participate remotely or do alternative things so that they can, so that they don't miss out so much. Angela, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's really tricky. Um, cause as I've alluded to, I teach a lab course, so usually attendance is pretty you required. Yeah. Um, with the caveat that if they're sick or something and they let me know ahead of time, then it doesn't affect their grade. It's more if someone doesn't show up and doesn't contact me, then it's like, oh, okay, a little bit of a participation panel, tiny, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I've been trying to think about ways, sort of low stake ways to for students to participate. Um, you know, we already have like pre-lab quizzes, but I'm adding sort of knowledge check quizzes along with content, which are optional, but like if you do it and I sh it shows that you tried, I can add that as sort of a cumulative participation slash attendance um, and maybe finding other ways like, hey, come to office hours, even if it ends up being that we chat about other things, like at least you're kind of being Engaged. present. Yeah. Um, and then in my class, the students, I'm going to ask them to do um, sort of weekly meetings with me. So like, again, I, I probably won't track attendance in the way I have previously, but if people are consistently just kind of coming to those or letting their team know if they can't make it and kind of taking it from pure attendance to more like professionalism and, um, you know, just trying to make sure they're connected a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely a struggle um, because I have two students who've already, they're not returning to campus and then kind of reached out and I had to assure them well, I'm echoing. I had to show them like, that's okay. We will make that work. Um, yeah. Also, because I'm anticipating we might go to fully online potentially anyway. So, so yeah, it's it's a struggle um, for sure. Yeah, so I, 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 I like that you, 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 I think you mentioned presence, maybe I did, but the professionalism, um, that they're engaged, that they're present. Are there alternative ways for them to show that they are engaged present, professional, active, part of the class besides actual attendance. If you can build that in, do it. That'd be great. OK. All right, that gives us, well, we are at 2 o'clock. Jessica, jump in. We're almost at, out of time. Right. I just want to say one thing quick. I was um, also working on the group that was putting together the student quarantine and isolation documentation. And that was kind of our, you know, what we focused on is that flexibility, the participation versus attendance, or how are there other ways to track attendance? Because, you know, we will definitely have students that are gonna have to quarantine, you know, for 14 days at a time, that if they were in an in-person course, they, they won't be able to participate like they used to. Um, but maybe if it's an online course, they still, you know, are able to do their work because they're just quarantining that um, not sick. So that is, um, look for that document. That should be coming Okay. Up. Yeah. And, you know, the, the look for that document is sort of the watchword or the watch phrase of the catchphrase of the, of the lab, of the semester. Um, things are going to change. And we'll close with this, I, this thought. Things are going to change. Your best plans are going to change and fail, et cetera. Um, so be agile, be flexible, um, invest your students in being agile and flexible and in, in it with you as co-conspirators, uh, co-participants. This is stuff we've got to figure out together and we're going to need the help of you and of your students and of your colleagues to, to do that. Angela, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'm doing advertising, but if anyone missed it, there's some information in the chat about an event tonight that's just a UW worker uh, safety panel um, 
just trying to invite people across campus to come and share. We're going to have representatives from like labor as well as, sorry, the trades as well as the TA graduate students. Um, and then I think we'll also have instructional and non-instructional um, people on the panel. So if anyone's interested, it's super cool. Um, I think it's going to be awesome. And then I guess I actually had a question for Jessica. Um, I was scrolling through the Q&A down at the bottom. And, and it mentioned... Let me interrupt just a second oh, to say sorry. that thank you. It is 2 o'clock, so if you need to go, feel free to do that. But please join in, and we, we all stick around for a couple more minutes afterwards um, to um, entertain questions, and et cetera. So all right, continue. OK, yeah. Um, I saw in the fact that it's you know the quarantine trigger is close exposure in air quotes um, for uh, over 15 minutes, less than six feet. And I guess, I don't know if there's going to be more clarity on that, because three hour class, yeah, we'll probably be at least, we will be at least six feet away, but with people moving around and it's three hours and we know that time and distance are factors. So do we know if there's going to be, I don't know, more information beyond that? Um, and maybe this is too broad of a question, but. Yeah, there's um, probably not going to be generally more information about that. I mean, um, that is kind of the basic definition. And then, of course, if someone tests positive, the contact tracers, you know, who are, um, you know, are the medical staff will will kind of do that follow up and talk through it with the person, um, you know, and they're looking at different periods of time um, when, when they felt they were most infectious, you know, and things like that. So I think a little bit more goes into it than that, but that's kind of the general rule. So um, we did want to put that out there just because a lot of people were asking, you know, if one person tests positive in my classes, everyone need to quarantine. And that um, that is, you know, not necessarily true. That's why we want to make sure we're trying to keep that distance as much as we can. So we don't all fall, you know, we wouldn't all fall into that definition. So not a great answer, but generally it's just that's the basic definition. All right. Any other questions from folks, thoughts, ideas? Lane, what's going on in Milwaukee? How, what's U of M's policy on all of this stuff? If you're still around. All right. So is everybody ready to go? Is it all going to be good? JT. I'm Thank you, Patty. I'm optimistic. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, if I, I'm not, well, I'm, I'm likely teaching in the fall, but everything's going to be um, online. And I think for me, I just struggle hearing the, the anxiety of faculty members and even senior faculty members who are teaching in person. I think, I don't know, I, I guess I'm at the point, you know, sort of the, the logic of the decision, but, you know, but that's sort of a personal stance, but I'm not sure yeah. to answer your question. Um, and it was something that came up actually um, in one of the comments here in the activity sheet is sort of, you know, the, the, the bitter irony of the fact that we're going to go into a classroom, everyone's going to have in earbuds, no one's going to be looking or talking to each other. Right. And that's the way that we're going to be connecting in the, the new classroom. And I don't know, it's far above my pay grade to make a lot of these decisions, but I think there's, yeah, a, truth, yeah. there's, a, there's a truth to that irony that, um, so in some ways, in some ways, this is already happening in social circles. In social circles, right? You'll see a, a a group of teenagers walking down, you know, somewhere, hanging out somewhere, and they'll be using their phones to chat with each other, to have, you know, personal side conversations with each other. That's already happening. It's just going to move into the classroom at this point. Um, yeah, so why yeah, not embrace it and no, get used to it and figure out how to harness it? No, but the difference is that those. You know the, the teenage crowd that you referenced they can put their phones down and still communicate with, with one another sure. versus in this instance there's a little bit more of a concern for communication because you can't see someone's face you can't 
reads lips, facial expressions are gone, so that interpersonal communication is taken away. The best you can maybe do is roll your eyes, but, you know. Well, they've got the eye roll emoticon, <laughs> right? You know, this is why this is why people invented emojis, yeah, right. so that yeah. we could we could do that sort of stuff. And people are, you know, I, I can have a good conversation with one person face to face while I'm having another conversation with somebody else. You know, not effectively, but I can I will feel as close, sometimes more close, with the person that's on the phone because of that mediation. I, I don't yeah. know. Thank you, Jessica. We I thank you so much for for being here to answer some questions that we could not. And it was it was easier than I had thought it might be. Yeah. And any of the other participants, thank you, Joanne. Joanne, um, feel free to just, you know, if you have any other questions, um, we are happy to, to well, thank you, entertain. Claire. Thank you, Claire. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, um, I guess next Tuesday we're talking about labs and laboratories and clinical experiences. And the next Wednesday is going to be an interesting one on equity and inclusion. In the town hall this morning, was it this morning? Yeah. Um, there was a lot about studio courses. Okay. Labs coming up. Um, it was a pretty sustained topic of conversation. So, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that'll work out. Yeah. All right. All right no other questions. Out. I'm out of here as well. Thank you all. Bye. 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 -bye.